write bios. None, none of them are ever humble. <laughs> so I failed in the first second of my talk. So I, I'm really, really, um, I think I'm afraid to be here more than excited because I was asked a month ago or whenever that was and I, I said yes because I actually rarely say no to anything. Um, but I didn't know what to say because I think 20 minutes talking about humility in itself is not very humble. And I don't think, and I still don't think I'm the best person to talk about this because I'm not the most obvious person to talk about this. If the talk was on energy or change or I don't know, anything else, I suppose I could talk you know, for hours as, as a lot of the publicist people here know. But I'm going to do my best, okay? So I come from an agency that stands for leading the change and I wanted to start with this because this idea of if 15 months ago, actually no, I said yes to publicist October 2013, so quite a while ago. If somebody had said, okay, you're going to have such a great ride, it's going to be exhilarating, but it's going to be deeply painful, you're sometimes going to regret it, you're going to cry a lot at home by yourself while your dog watches you, because I live alone, um, but you're going to have such great highs and very deep lows and you're gonna wonder how you know what to do how to do most of the time and you're gonna fake it till you make it which is what a lot of us do in advertising you know would you take on this job um, and it's also going to incredibly make you uh, make you feel humbled every step of the way I would probably say no because I came from a very comfortable place my ex agency I was there for 10 years and more than that, like most people, I have a very simple relationship with pain, which is, I don't like pain. So, um, but then here I am, many, many months later, and absolutely with no regret. And the one takeaway, I mean, I'm gonna start with the conventional definition of humility. I'm going to explain the 10 things I've learned that for me created a shift in my head as to what humility could stand for today. The context of this, of this idea of humility is in leadership because Grace told me to make it personal. And so to make it personal, I got to talk about you know, what I've been going through in the last year. Okay, so humility. I have nothing to do with these slides. My guys back in the office beautifully art directed it. Um, and I said, why? Why an astronaut? Oh, okay, I get it. Because you know, when you, if you ever go to the moon, you realize the world is so large and you're a teeny, teeny, tiny thing and that gives context to yourself. Uh, so, based on dictionary.com, um, humility is a modest opinion or estimate of one's own importance, rank, or having a clear perspective and respect for one's place or context. That's the conventional meaning of humility. Then I asked myself, okay, um, this is a bit difficult because when I think of humility, I think of all these people. I think of the Pope, I think of Nelson Mandela and the Dalai Lama and Mother Teresa and Gandhi, largely because I grew up very Catholic back home. And so I have a very religious flavor when I think of humility. And then I could think, oh gosh, they all are, you know, gracious, excellent human beings who serve a very big purpose or do their daily work for a bigger force. I immediately think, when you think humility, they should be here talking about this because they see themselves as small, as tools or vessels for something greater than themselves. And so, you know, really, they stand for the greater good. And last night, I was thinking before I slept, we are so seduced by people who are great, who do the greater good, who also stay humble. We love that about people. 
So I thought, okay, I'm really gonna fail in this talk because, you know, th what's the credibility? I work in advertising. Because in advertising, <laughs> it's not known to make the world a better place. You know, we're here to beat each other, to make money, and to be famous. That's what advertising is. Our intent is not noble. In fact, the other day, I was walking with someone, I think it was yesterday, and she was saying, you know, advertising is full of people. If you want to, you know, amalgamate all the bad traits and characteristics of a human being, it's called advertising. So that, okay, <laughs> shit. So, um, and then I thought, okay, well, I'll try my best. I work for an agency with 107 people. And if I ask myself, what's my context and what's my place, um, you know, amongst this 107 people, I am really personally responsible for the following. Their fulfillment, their desires, their hopes, their output, because we have clients, their performance, and especially, and more important, most importantly, their personal growth. I'm not sure if they know this, but I try my very best to, to show that as much as I can. Now, what that means, uh, this is my office. It looks better than, than it does, but um, what, what that means is, you know, apart from what we have to do for clients, it's, they're my internal clients. So what are the 10 things I've learned? I'm going to destroy whatever personal brand I have because I'm going to say I love Taylor Swift <laughs> and I love this song and I think it's great that I'm using this image. Um, the first thing I didn't think I would go through, but is the, one of the main things I've learned in this role is that people are going to hurt you. They're going to disappoint you. They're going to let you down. They're not necessarily going to tell you the whole truth. Um, and, and I realized after a, quite a while that it's okay. It's okay because it's what the job calls for. And I don't mean hurt you intentionally. I don't think everyone, anyone really does that, you know, most of the time. It just means that I'm in a very imperfect world. I'm going to keep using the word I a lot because, you know, Grace said to make it personal, so apologies for that. Um, and in this imperfect world, emotions drive advertising. It's very volatile because of that. Clients get emotional, agency people. I mean, it's a creative industry, right? So because there's a lot of emotions in play, it's volatile. It changes. People change their minds. People, you know, it's a human business. And I'm very emotional, too, as people know. And I can get defensive like the rest of them. And I wear my heart on my sleeve. But the one thing I picked up was if, be, if it's going to hurt, as a leader, I can't take it too personally. It doesn't mean that it's not about what I've done or what I haven't done. It's just that this idea of a very humbling experience, this idea of becoming a bigger person is not noble. It's humbling. It's humbling because you realize that people are imperfect. Even if you know that, you don't know it until you get hurt. And that you yourself are imperfect because you're going to react to that pain. So the first thing is, while there is pain, it doesn't have to be personal. The second thing I realize is that I often have to apologize even for things I don't really know why I'm apologizing for. And, and that's okay too, because again, the context is leadership. So the example I'm going to give is, you know, we ended on a very large high last year. It was a huge transformational year for us. You know, it was a difficult year and we ended on a big, big, big high. And so we, you know, came into work in January and thought, okay, we're going to win lots of more stuff, but we didn't. And the first big pitch that we had was we were like 90% there and we were told and principled that we were going to win and that we're the preferred agency and it's a large piece of business and we would have met 50% of our new business target in January, completely unheard of and all that. And then overnight we lost something we didn't really win. But it's not the fact that we lost, it's how we lost. We felt completely used. So if there are any clients here, my only advice is it's not the fact that you don't appoint the agency, it's how you don't appoint an agency that really counts. So the breakup, was really tough for a lot of us because it was really good work and it was just an email and it was you know we felt very we felt it was quite rude so i wrote an email to the client to the ceo and the ceo and it was in a nutshell a career limiting email because it was a very eloquent way of saying well fuck you too <laughs> and um and i never wrote anything like that in my life trust me even if i'm quite bold um because i i thought 
how could you do this? We wrote the brief on the 26th, which is Boxing Day, and there were people, I mean, like the pain of my team was so palpable. And what they don't know, and if they're in the audience right now, this is the first time I'm gonna admit it, and it's like four months later, is my email to the CEO was my apology to them. I couldn't really say sorry because it felt so trite. And I wanted to apologize to them for somebody else's behavior and just apologize for the fact that, oh my God, I can't believe this happened to us because it was really, really tough. So it was the first big humbling event of the year because um, it didn't really matter how, how, you know, how good we were. It's just, um, it was everything else that counted apart from the work. Third thing I learned is that, you know, I'm not good at this. I don't know how to change course because I'm quite stubborn sometimes. And um, so I'm going to talk about a client that we won last year, a fairly large client. We're doing really good work for them. And we wanted to get a large chunk of that client's business. So we had part one, we wanted part two. And we stood a very, very good chance. But then one day, one of those clients, and please don't try to guess if you work at Publicis, um, was very rude to one of my senior leadership members. Really rude. I mean, there's rude and there's crass rude. And, you know, this man was in tears and he's, you know, an older guy, he's not young. And I thought, you know what? Let's say his name is John. You know what, John? Why don't we fire the client? But I meant it. And it's not because I'm brave that I said that. It's because this guy was the only guy who can work on this account. But if he can't because he's so destroyed, there's no point. I knew I wouldn't be able to find anyone in time anyway, and I never give up. So to change course and to say, I might lose half a million dollars for the following year, but you know, if I lose John, you know, it, it, I'll probably lose a bit more. And so we have to change course. We not only are, we're not only not gonna go after part two, we might just lose the whole thing. And I knew I was gonna get in trouble for that, but we tried anyway. In the end, we didn't lose the client. In the end, I spoke to the client. It was very tense, it was in my office, and I said, look, you know what, that was really not cool, and you know, fine, whatever, we had a misunderstanding. And now we doubled the size of that client. And I think it was partly accidental, partly luck. But the learning from that is, I'm very stubborn. If I want something, I'll just go for it from a commercial point of view. But knowing when to change course is that what's at stake? What's at stake was that this guy, John, I was either going to lose him or he, he felt so bad about himself and he lost his confidence. And that was incredibly humbling for me to realize that I couldn't help him. That the only way to help him was to say, let's walk away. Which is related to this other point, and this sounds very cliche-ish, but it's very different when you go through it. Because in advertising, people say things like, well, you know, yeah, okay, it's tough, but if you put your mind to it, we can do it. You know, nothing is impossible, and all that stuff we tell ourselves. But, you know, it's been an unforgiving year for us in Publicis. We had to change a lot of things. We, we lost people. We gained people. And the one thing I've learned every day when I go home is, you know what, we're limited as human beings. We can't do everything. And even if we sacrifice our whole lives, um, it's, it's not enough. Um, so I have a fairly large client, and again, please don't try to guess. And I realize that, you know, I'm so used to solving problems for clients. I'm so used to being the person they go to. And I was the worst person for this client. It's not the skill. It's not anything but chemistry or Maybe they just thought I wasn't good enough. And up to today, I think maybe I'm not good enough for them. So knowing my own limitations in a very senior role is very humbling because you think you're empowered to do anything, and I am, but I'm the worst person for that role, uh, as it turns out, so we had to get somebody else. And, you know, that's incredibly humbling too. Um, defeat. I'm very bad at defeat. I don't know about you. I hate to lose. And um, the losses has been as often as the wins. And that's because we're in a startup turnaround mode. And as much as we were impatient or are impatient to do well, it's realistic to know that for every three wins, you're going to have, you know, maybe six losses. As I was judging the FEs twice in the first round and the final round, and I'm very competitive. And I'm thinking, 
why did our name only show up X number of times? You know, from the 100 entries to the 25 um, finalists. The FEs is the Effectiveness Award for, for, for work. But then I realized while judging in the last round that it is really inspiring to see better work. I mean, you know, we say that, but a lot of us are really jealous of that because we think we could have thought of that. Why, why didn't we think of that? Oh, they have a better client. You know, we're so good at rationalizing. But I thought looking at these, I, I saw an unknown digital agency, which I thought did the most incredible work and I can't say more. And a popular agency who really did do good work in the last year. And I actually went home thinking that was very inspiring. It's very inspiring to realize that a small agency can do great work and has no excuse for themselves. And a big agency can continue to do good work because they believe in it. And even for somebody as competitive as me, I thought it's humbling to be inspired by defeat or by loss or by this idea that you know, you've become insecure because you're not as good as the next person. I never knew this until I joined Publicis. Good is good enough. I hate that statement. It's never good enough. It's never good enough. And, you know, if it's, not, if it's mediocre, let's, move, let's, let's not go home. But then again, sometimes it is. Because if at the rate I was going, I was never going to go on holiday. And I didn't for the first year. And when I finally went on holiday, I went two weeks ago, I, and a proper holiday at that, I thought, it's a very, very long road. See, when you're young, and young means, I guess, 20 to, no offense, 45 maybe is young in advertising. Um, you think, oh, I can do that, I can do that, I can go on with no sleep, I can drink coffee all day long, but then you know you're limited. You're physically limited, you're emotionally limited, you're mentally limited, and so at the end of the day, if the road is so long, you just have to go fine. It's enough, because if not, you burn out. And so I finally understood the meaning of burnout on this job. And if I don't watch it, you know, I'm going to suffer and everybody else suffers. So never mind if the font is not perfect, because I'm a font Nazi. And never mind if the keynote isn't perfect. Or, you know, if, even if, you know, I'm not there in a meeting, then it's not gonna, the world's not going to end. Now, everybody knows this, but this is really hard to do. Really, really hard to do, especially if you're in a position of influence. Because... It is unnatural to be in a position of influence and not feel like you have to be the smartest person in the room. And if people say, oh yeah, but you know what? No, every leader feels that they have to be the smartest person in the room. Every leader feels like they have to earn the right to be called the leader. In fact, if you talk to any therapist, and I learned this from my own personal counseling and life coaching, that the number one fear of leaders is that they're not good enough and that they are in fact a fraud. So it is incredibly humbling. I interviewed about, I don't know, 120 people last year to meet people who are really smart, really young, really ambitious, and to go, well, what's your choice? If talent is our economy, if talent is our only resource, you have to get the best people. It is also very humbling to see people who are against this. And I deal with this. I still deal with this. I still deal with people who are insecure, don't want the best talent in the room, sometimes their clients, sometimes their colleagues, sometimes, you know, whatever. And it's hard to surmount that, but you have to keep going and you have to find a way to either educate them or change them. Understand where people are coming from. Again, it sounds very generic, but the number one driver of people, I find, is fear. You know, they tell you A, B, C, D, E, but they're not really telling you A, B, C, D, E. What they're saying is, I'm afraid. I'm afraid to fail, so I'm going to quit. I'm afraid I won't do a good job, so let me leave now in peace. I'm afraid I'm going to disappoint you. I'm afraid um, everyone here is not good enough, and so I can't deliver. I'm afraid you don't understand me. I'm afraid you're not good enough as a leader. I'm afraid you misled me. I'm afraid you lied to me. I'm afraid you're too strong for me, I'm, or whatever it is. You know, it's really fear. And when I started to realize that fear drives everything, again, incredibly humbling, again, incredibly humbling to see people who really should be blameless, who, I, who we really or I really shouldn't react to, because everybody has fears. And it just changes the, the language and it changes your perspective. It's all about the work. But the thing is, the work is personal. It's personal because you give up your personal time. 
it's personal because you give up time with your kids and your loved ones and time for yourself. So how do you make it impersonal and make it about the work and not react personally? Um, it's hard. It's humbling. But there's no formula to it. It's just a reminder daily, sometimes hourly. I take walks, two walks, sometimes three walks now in the day to remind myself. It really is about the organization. If there's nothing larger than the agency, but the agency itself, then it's not about me, even as the leader. Then it's not about the person complaining in front of me. It really is just about that greater good, which in this case is where the agency needs to go. Last but not the least, know who you're really working for. Now, I, I struggled with this since I was 21 because I come from a very hierarchical culture in the Philippines where you have a boss, your boss has a boss, you can't go to your boss's boss. Then I went to Singapore and nobody really kind of cares about that. People kind of got corners, I find, and it was a very, very big cultural shock. So when I took on this role, I asked myself, well, who am I working for? Because I was really afraid of losing authenticity if I only worked for myself because I've had very interesting bosses who I've seen change over the years who was about the larger vision and eventually to protect yourself because it is brutal becomes about themselves and in itself there's nothing wrong with that but then do you only work for yourself and it's incredibly humbling to realize that no I work for myself, I don't work for my boss, but I also work for a hundred and seven people. I don't know if I actually am successful in letting them understand that, probably not half the time, probably yes, half the time. And when you realize that you work for a hundred and seven people, the perspective changes, it becomes incredibly humbling and you know your context. Suddenly I realize I'm that astronaut where the universe is big, it's not the universe of my room or what I think or what I feel. The universe is what everybody feels and thinks and is afraid of and the pain that they're going through. That then underlines the importance or lack of, of oneself. So I, you know, I got this only yesterday. I have nothing to do with it. It was like WhatsApp to me and I thought, oh my God, what a perfect ending to this talk. I think it went viral recently, the moral bucket. You've seen that on Facebook and etc. And this is the shift. So the 10 things I learned are just 10 things I've learned. You may have learned half of it on your own. But I want to read this very slowly because it's really striking. We live in the culture of the big me. The meritocracy wants you to promote yourself. And social media has not helped. Okay? But all the people I've ever deeply admired are profoundly honest about their own weaknesses. They have identified their core sin, whether it is selfishness, the desperate need for approval, cowardice, hard-heartedness, or whatever. I just want to pause there and say everybody's guilty of this, right? They have traced how that core sin leads to the behavior that makes them feel ashamed. They have achieved a profound humility which has best been defined as an intense self-awareness from a position of other-centeredness. So my take on this is, I started to go on solo holidays that I've never ever done in my life, but I've only done in this role. And I didn't even really know why I was doing that. I thought I was tired and wanted to get away from people. But the bottom line is, there's no time to think and there's no time to reflect. And in several of those reflections, I felt this shame, this shame that, well, of course I want to be recognized. Of course I want to be seen as good as any guy in a boardroom. And of course I want to be heard, and of course I have so much to prove. And of course, this, 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 that, that. And I have my own sins, which is, you know, too reactive, too emotional, takes it too personally sometimes, wanting for approval, who's I don't even know. I don't think it's cowardice. I don't think it's hard-heartedness um, and all that. But when the context is this 107 people, I'm not even counting the clients, it's the 107 people, that is the other-centeredness. And when I shifted it on them, I realized I'm so small, they don't think that, but I do feel that. And that the awareness has changed for me. And that freed me. I felt that, oh, to be humble is not to be grounded. 
to be humble is not to be shy and it's not to have empathy it's not to sound so nice and good and profound it's to understand that the ultimate humility is making it about the people that you're helping and you're nurturing if they want it and if they don't then let's move on now i'm a work in progress i am not the bastion of humility please don't think that i don't even sound it um, but this is the shift that I'd like to share in today's age that I feel is relevant. And I think the idea of humility is deeply personal. It's something you have to go and define on your own. It's different for leadership. It's different for people moving up. It's different for somebody who's not necessarily working in advertising. But this is what I wanted to share this morning. Um, and I hope you picked up a thing or two. Thank you very, very much. Okay, questions. Hello, uh, I'd like to ask, what do you find lacking in today's young leaders? Many things. But see, I'll answer that in two ways. You, you, we can't fault the young. That means I'm not young anymore. We can't fault the young because, you know, the saying, the youth is wasted on the young. They don't have the perspective because they're young. But the one thing I will point out, so I can't say patience, I can't say foresight, long-term thinking. You're not supposed to have that when you're young, right? But the one thing I realized recently is that there is so much to gain from the process itself. And I'm very much about results. But the process of doing an excellent pitch even if you don't win the process of giving person a, ch a chance even if you really want to kill that person already because it's taking forever for that person to understand or do well or whatever the process in itself will help any individual especially if you're younger in the long run that stays with you and i think that's what young people should understand and embrace does that answer your question Anyone from publicists dare <laughs> ask a question? <laughs> yes, Tara. Um, yeah, I'm very curious. Like, I know we've been having discussions about this like, with the future people. So how do you manage things like, you know, like when you start to either work your way to the top or go to the top, the idea of personal branding today, and you know, some of that PR stuff that people feel they have to do to compete, and still kind of coming off as being humble, being kind of collaborative and things like that. How do you balance those two things and do it the right way? Okay, because I'm not that young, I'm gonna say, I'm still reacting to that question. I'm gonna say I grew up in an era, there was no social media. I had beeper, I had a beeper. But at one point I shared with an ex, so can you imagine? Um, I, there was no personal branding and I come from a, a hun, well, 100 million now in the Philippines. And you know, everyone's hungry, everyone wants to not kill each other, but you know, try to beat each other. So uh, my personal formula was there was no personal branding. It was, I tried very hard to be who I was. I had really good bosses. Then I came here and then I realized, oh, everybody has personal branding. Okay, still didn't do that. I'm, I'm old school. I, I come from the, think, from, the, from the thinking that your work will speak for yourself. For, speak for itself. However, what I did rebel against was this idea that we always had to be nice. Now, I'm not saying I'm not nice or I'm not for nice, but I find that Singapore is so networky. No offense, this is a networking session, but it's so networky. It's so like, I know this and I know this and we're good friends after two meetings. You know, I think you, you, I think you earn the right to network. I think what works better is you earn the right to network after you've done the work. Not, I have a safety net because I have a network, never mind how good the work is. And so my formula was work like a dog, and then, oh, it got a bit recognized, and it took a very long time, zero shortcut. Oh, there's a bit of awareness. Oh, there's a bit of PR, which I didn't even realize. And then I took on this role, and then you have to work on your personal brand. So the long story short is, it, sorry, the short story to that long thinking is, it came at the end for me. Almost the personal branding is now I have to, not a want to, because for 
10 years before this role, I didn't do any of this. Because I had a boss who was doing it. And again, I'm old fashioned. It's easy to say I did this on Facebook or whatever. And it's noise, isn't it? A lot of it is noise. And so what people will remember is if you're authentic, not if you're nice. If your work is authentic, if you work hard, not if you're nice. So I have, I have something against just being nice and not wanting to piss off anyone and being so networky, as you know, because you have to be seen as that person. Who cares? You know, it's your work, it's your word, and it's how authentic you come across in an industry that is anything but authentic. And I think that's what, that's a better formula. Great. Somebody wants to ask? Um, so I have a question. How did you get started with humility? Like, what do you recommend small steps to take for someone to get to that space of humility? So, so first of all, I'm the worst person to ask about that because I don't walk into a room going, oh, she's so hot. You will notice me in a room, I'm very, very loud, okay? I don't even need this mic. Um, no, it's not that there are steps that, that, that uh, to be humble, I'm gonna start with this. I started with the idea of what has humbled me. See, the only way anything can humble you is if you let it. Because there are people who, leaders or not, who go, well, it's not my fault, or, well, what can I do? It's beyond me. And I hear that a lot from peers, from above, from below, from whatever, clients. But you know, me, I think it's an attitude of, well, okay, if I let my ego get bruised once in a while, and if I really think about why that happened, maybe I really wasn't good enough. Maybe I really did let that person down. I think the ability to consider and to face yourself, even if you're inflicting pain on yourself, is the start of this journey called humility. And to allow something to constantly humble you, I think is the hardest part of this process. Does that answer your question? I think the, yep. Yeah. What's the reward of being humble? Because I'm nothing. <laughs> I don't know why people want to be. Uh, no, I, look, I don't think it's a reward of being humble. If I'm humble, therefore, I'm going to be like a Dalai Lama. No, I don't think so. I think what you get out of it is a perspective. You know, like, I, like again, a year ago, if somebody said, you're going to get hurt, you're going to get disappointed, you're going to get disillusioned, you're going to, I would not be here, right? Why would I put myself to that? But what's the reward from that? It's very simple. Without pain, there is no growth. The reward is only personal growth. And it is, the more painful it is, unfortunately, the more you grow. And you don't want to self-inflict pain, but in a human business, it's going to be 80% painful. Not even less than that. 80% painful, 20% extremely rewarding. Is that 20% proportionate to the 80? Absolutely, if you want to grow. But if you don't, no. So I decided I wanted to grow. I decided I wanted to be the best version of myself. And that means, you know, I have to not grow a thicker skin, but just have a wider perspective of how, you know, tough and human the process is. That's all. Yep. Of the 10 lessons that you learned, which was most profound for you? The first. Because I've disappointed, I mean, I shouldn't say I, though people will disappoint you. I've disappointed people too. And you don't set out a job thinking you will disappoint because you know, oh, well, I'm in charge now, right? But, um, and you know, you don't start out a love relationship thinking you'll disappoint. I remember a counselor once told me, when you fall in love, and that applies to a job, you have in a straight relationship, guy, girl. Girl has a bubble of guy. Guy has a bubble of girl. I think he's this, 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 this. I think she's like this. And you're kind of in love with the version that's in that bubble, in that head. And then over time, the bubble breaks. Do you stay? Do you go? Do you get married? And you just, you know, live with it. 
and have a partnership. That's the same with a job that you love. You don't set out thinking all these traits will disappoint you. You build it up in your head. You don't think you're going to disappoint your, your colleagues or people working for you. So the idea now that this is the, this is the norm, the new normal is that it will be disappointing. You know, what's your choice? Do you become cynical, which I seriously considered, by the way? Do you protect yourself, which I seriously, obviously, consider all the time? Or do you go, you know what? If what you can offer is some humanity in this role, you can't be too cynical. Therefore, it's the idea that that's just the way it is. You just have to find a way to deal with the fact that you will disappoint and that it will disappoint. And it's okay. It's going to hurt, but it's okay. Yeah. And do a uh, very good um, presentation. Um, I'd like to ask, like in this uh, world where young people are increasingly validated by social media, and um, the fact that you know they are, even their personal identity is sort of defined by the second or third line they are living on Facebook or Instagram. Um, what would your advice be to a young person when it comes to? remaining humble despite the fact that you know they every day they are being bombarded by um, uh, the need to be liked. Yeah that's a really so two or three things from that question. The first is it's not just young people. We all create personas, all of us. So that's one. Two, um, and I'm guilty of that as well, trust me. Three, I don't think it's about I want to be humble and therefore I need to do something different. The goal is not to be humble. I think the symptom of social media, or the sim sorry, the illness that social media exposes is not that people don't want to be humble. It's that they want to connect. It's a lack of connectivity or real connection that now they have artificially, I mean, it's a very general statement, artificially um, translated into a connection. I'm just going to blast out what I'm doing and you know, see what people are going to say about me. I want someone to like me so that, you know, I'll feel validated. So it, it's not a question about humility. I think it's a question of real con human connection. So the only advice I would have because I'm older and I'm more traditional than people realize is that a cup of coffee can solve a lot of problems with a friend or a stranger. A conversation over an email for me, I'm an email person as well, but you know what? A conversation can cure a lot more things. Or a handshake, or looking at a person, or calling a person. Nobody uses their phones these days to call. It's always text. I'm guilty of that. But you know, I think to solve that issue of human connection is to have the human in front of you. That would be my advice to everybody, including myself. <laughs> so I have to pick the right question? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, Tarad, sorry, you're not going to win anything, because <laughs> I know you. Um, I think the hardest question will win. So maybe the girl who asked me, you, congratulations. <laughs> Thanks, guys. <laughs>